In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, Christ is risen. What good news. What good news. Uh, I sort of feel like I'm like getting in like a spaceship or something, like I'm getting ready to like take off in this thing. Um, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, so, as Father said, I am the Director of Ministry for Orthodox Youth and Young Adult Ministries, OYM, and it's an agency that was developed by the Assembly of Bishops. Uh, for the sake of really trying to unify and give a solid vision for what ministry to youth and young adults uh, can look like in an orthodox context. And part of the thing that we've been running into is that we've, you know, for so many years done this kind of like youth ministry thing, young adult ministry thing, uh, ministry to like whatever demographic. And what we've begun to realize is that really ministry is just ministry and people need to be ministered to all around. And so one of the big things that we kind of have in our mind is what would it look like as Orthodox Christians to create a culture where everyone is ministering to one another, where we become one another's uh, brothers and sisters for real, where we truly dwell together as a household of God, where we love one another, where we learn to forgive one another, to show mercy on one another, uh, where we're involved in each other's lives, lifting one another up. Because the question that I've gotten in the 15 years that I've worked in, in youth ministry, more than any other question, is why do young people leave the church? And there's a lot of reasons, I think, that probably people will try to give to answer that question, and it's a valuable question, but we all come at it from our different perspectives. And to that end, I've kind of gotten personally wondering if that is the right question. Maybe that isn't the question that we should be asking, but rather the question that maybe we need to start asking is how do we make sure the church is a place they want to stay? How do we make sure that this is the place where they find the answers to their deepest questions, where they find the fulfillment of their deepest longings about who they want to become, where they feel like they can belong, and what they feel their life has meaning for? What if that was what we really were able to present well? And I guess the question that we have before us at OYM and with you all partnering with you is how do we do that? How do we make sure that this church, that our communities, that we become one household of God that is devoted to our young people, that we actually do ministry on their behalf, that we do things with them, that we do things for them. And today, as I've been sort of thinking through things, uh, I think the gospel and the epistle kind of have some ideas for us. So what we're presented with in the gospel right in the beginning is Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin were the council of the Pharisees that, were, that condemned Jesus to death. So they were the ones who kind of said, this has got to end, this Jesus guy has got to go. And Joseph, one of the members of the Sanhedrin, takes courage, the scripture says, and he goes to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus, which is just remarkable. I mean, here is Joseph. He was at the meeting when they decided, like, this guy's got to go. And so Joseph takes courage and goes to Pilate and says, I want the body of this man. Give me the body of Jesus of Nazareth. And you can imagine the opposition that Joseph might have been getting himself into. Like if his Sanhedrin buddies found out that he was going to, to Pilate asking for the body of the man they had just condemned to death. Whoa, I mean, this would really put him at odds with all of his friends. So he was taking a great risk. It was a great risk going against the religious elite of the day, going up against the Roman government, asking for the body of Jesus who was crucified as a criminal. And then we also see the myrrh-bearing women coming to the tomb because they are coming also to care for the body of Christ. But they also are coming up against some obstacles, aren't they? There's a huge stone in the way, and they don't know what they're going to do about it. There's all these obstacles that stand in the way for these people getting to the body of their Lord. But the thing is that these were people who were madly in love with him. They loved him. And they had put all of their hope in him. They thought that he was going to be the one that was going to restore the kingdom of Israel, that was going to knock out Roman oppression. And here he was, dying at the hand of the state. Man, you can imagine their hopes must have been dashed. Their hopes for what he was going to do, for who he was going to be. And yet, they loved him. At this point, it didn't matter. They didn't know that he was going to come back. They thought he was just gone forever. But they loved him, and so they went to care for his body. They had to. They, nothing could stop them 
not the government, not the religious elite, not even a giant stone in the way of the tomb. And I think that this is something for us as well. That our, the fulfillment of our love for Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of a life that has been restored, that has been renewed in him, is that we likewise must care and tend to his body. We must go against all obstacles to care for the body of Christ. And what is the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, if not one another? We are that body that we've been charged to care for. Our youth, our young adults, everybody in this room, the person to your right, the person to your left, your belonging in this body is inextricably linked to each person in this room. And therefore, we must care for one another. We must become a community. We must become communities in this world of love. Communities where everyone belongs, where we are given purpose and identity. And I think if we do this, if we see this, I think we'll see some trends reverse. Because if you look again at the epistle, or the reading from Acts, the Hellenist widows are being d- denied their daily distribution of food. You know, they're not getting what they need. And so it causes division in the church. And so what the the apostles decide to do is to ordain deacons to care and to distribute the food, to serve the tables, is what what it says. And I think that this is another image for us. Because for the Lord, for our body, communion and community happens at a table. It happens when we're with one another, when we're sharing meals with one another, when we're in each other's lives, when we're in each other's homes. This is how things grow. And we see that after that, it says the number of disciples greatly multiplied because they were actually sharing meals with one another. They were being together. They were tending to the needs of the community. They were tending to the wounds in the body. So what does this actually mean for us? It's all nice, right? Well, in 2019... Cigna released a study saying that Generation Z was the loneliest generation ever to exist in America. And recently, more studies have come out saying that there is something of actually an epidemic of loneliness happening in America. That across generations, fewer and fewer people are saying that they feel like someone really knows them. Fewer and fewer people report having close friends. You know, I once heard someone say, what's the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed? Having 12 close friends in his 30s. (laughs) And it's like we laugh because we're like, haha, that's funny. But it's also sadly true, right? I mean, I'm I'm a grown man in my 30s, and the older that I get, the harder it is to make close friends. For whatever reason, we just have a harder time with it. But what if the church could be a place that actually bucked that trend? What if we could be the ones who were a force of relational reconciliation in a world that has been torn apart in the last four years? What if we could be the place where people come to find healing and love to get their daily distribution of communion and community? What if that could be us? Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Who wouldn't want to be here? Because that is the fulfillment of everything that it means to love the Lord as we see from Joseph and the myrrh-bearing women to care for the wounds of the body of Christ. And we are all walking around wounded, needing one another, needing to be anointed with oil, welcomed to the table, and given love. Are we not? I know I am. We need one another. So, if you think of someone in your life who has become distant, someone who may need someone, Reach out, send a message, give a call, have a cup of coffee, because that is where communion begins, and it's where it ends with our Lord, at his table, as he welcomes us into his kingdom. To him be the glory, forever and ever. Amen.